Welcome to this week's episode of The Nero Show. In today's episode, World Tour Cycling just became affordable. Let's check out this decathlon bike. Pinarellos are too stiff and the specialized Atheos is a noodle. A pro mechanic gives us some insight into some of the best and worst bikes he's seen in the last couple of years. And what do you need at home to be a decent home mechanic? All right, let's get into it. All right, this is this is the show I didn't think was going to happen, but here we are. For those of you on YouTube, suddenly you've just been shocked to see that there's someone else sitting across the table from myself. Welcome, Edwin. Thanks very much for having me, Chris. Uh, Edwin was going to come in anyway. We were going to do a big show with Edwin, but huge news this week. I'm not actually sure. I, well, I'm going to go for it anyway, but the, the Nero family has grown by one. Uh, Jesse and his wife have welcomed their new son. And so we've decided to, to give him a week of paternity leave. And the man himself, Edwin Britz, has, has stepped in. Do you want to maybe give yourself a little, a little introduction? Yeah, why not? Um, so Chris and I, um, we've known each other for a few years um, through racing in Sydney, local racing, um, and then extending onto national level racing in the NRS um, and then Chris used to, um, run a team, rival, called, team. <laughs> rival, rival team, rival team, rival team, um, called Nero racing. Chris has come to, to me in a bike shop. I work at like fairly frequently for a million power meter changes every other <laughs> week for his, uh, strenuous testing program. But, um, yeah, from there we, we've had good chats, um, on the bike, off the bike. And, uh, it's sort of just culminated in, Coming here and um, shedding some light, some in industry insight on bikes and uh, riding and racing, I guess. So, yeah. Look, I, I, I don't, we could easily, and we probably will at some point, do a do a proper like sit down with mechanic type chat with yourself, with with JC. But I kind of thought this week we just carry on as usual. We've, we've got plenty, actually a good bit happened this week. So there's a good bit we can sort of start off on. The first one I was kind of interested in was this, the Van Rizzle, the the rumored wasn't really rumored because it was was probably announced a while ago. But the Van Rizzle is officially AG two R decathlon bike for twenty twenty four. Sell me this concept, Edwin. This this bike. Uh, what do you think of it? Historically, in the World Tour, you only get the best manufacturers who put the most R and D into their frames, and then riders are riding you know, bikes that are $20,000 in the Tour de France, like they're riding the best of the best bikes. And that's kind of how bike brands have operated on selling their bikes to customers. They've always been, you know, they make a hero product, they make a really expensive frame, they give it to the riders at the Tour, they ride it and they, based on that, saying these are the best riders in the world riding this, we've made the best bike, it's going to cost you this much. That's how these bikes sell, essentially. Um, and then Decathlon come along and they're a very, let's say, affordable entry-level kind of brand. Um, and they're offering a top-end bike that's going to be ridden at the Tour de France for a, I mean, entry-level is very relative at this sort of price point, yeah. but it's, it's entry-level in the sense that like a normal person could put aside some money and actually afford a bike that would be ridden at the Tour de France. That, where that word will get you killed on YouTube. <laughs> Anytime you mention affordable, I actually had a look at that that bike radar video. They did a pretty good intro of this whole thing. And I think the thumbnail or something was like, affordable Tour de France bike. And of course, the first comment underneath it is, affordable? Yeah. I hate that. But you're right, relatively. Relatively so, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's compared to, comparatively speaking, like we're looking at, teams um, riding bikes that are in excess of 20,000 Australian dollars. Like Ineos are riding Pinarello Dogma Fs with, you know, the, the best of the best componentry, like Shimano 12 speed, that's 20 grand. Like Yumbo Visma are running the best of the best S5s with SRAM Red, 20 grand again. And then you've got um, Van Rizzle, which is the decathlon brand coming in at, Around about like it's not a huge amount less, but it's sort of closer to fifteen thousand dollars is what they're selling it to you, the consumer at, like fully built from them. So yeah, it's it's, it's a little bit less, but I mean, you know, at that kind of top end of the sport, if you're making savings like that, 
financially. Like, you know, it's a big deal. I feel like this is going to be a a big deal in Europe. Like decathlon in Europe is is massive. Like it's it's easily the biggest sporting goods producer. So to, to be able to walk into essentially like Rebel Sport or Dick Sporting Goods and buy something that's close to a, a world tour bike is sort of ridiculous. I will say like, and I am def, I'm sort of on this um, Australia, US, anti, not anti-Europe buzz at the moment, but like this, this is going to be available in Europe. It'll be, you know, pumped out through the decathlon stores in Europe. Everywhere else, not really probably going to get much. Like I was having a quick chat to, to Grant GC Performance and he was, because he's got one, he's ridden one, right? And he was sort of saying, oh, look, he's, they were maybe going to have offer it out through a couple of retailers and it was going to be like cherry picked off the top. So it, was, it wasn't going to be this sort of mass market thing in the US. And definitely here, I don't see like there's going to be any push out of this sort of bike. So half of me on that sort of sense is like, well, if it's not really going to be coming out here, then don't really care that much. But Yeah, I don't think it's going to make the biggest difference out here, but like, personally and also because like the markup here is just it's too it's it's still like it's still a very expensive bike like you're not getting like the jesse coil special of like you know tour de france winning race bike for like eight grand or like five grand or however much you would have paid probably like you know 50 cents but this i've seen some people making a big deal out of this out of this from the sense like oh this is the first cheap chinese brand we've seen in the world tour it's not really that though is it because this this to me is like in its own little sort of pigeonhole it's it's not a win space this is not a yolio direct to consumer chinese brand from like what i would imagine like well just based on like the press release from like ag2i themselves it seems like they've had quite a lot of input into the development of this bike and i feel like they would have like chosen the componentry and the like that being like the handlebars and the stems and the wheels and and such like they've sort of tailored that to fit this bike perfectly for them so it's not like they're just getting like a a open mold frame and then just throwing a bunch of different components on it i feel like they would have designed this frame for the team for those kind of like components that they're throwing on there which bear in mind are really good those um, wheels are sick. Those wheels are unreal. Yep. The Swiss, do you want to talk about wheels? Uh, we can talk about wheels. Yeah, let's, let's do it. What do you think of them? Um, the Swiss sides, they're po- probably the most aero wheels and probably like the best wheels you can buy. Um, very popular in the triathlon space in Australia. Um, very rarely do you see roadies rolling around on Swiss side. Can I make an admission? I'd literally never heard of them. Like literally never heard of them. Unless you're a massive nerd and you really care about aero, you're probably not aware. Um, DT Swiss, they use Swiss side to to basically like design all their rim profiles for the, for the road, like for their highest end wheel sets. Because um, Swiss side, they have their own wind tunnel. Um, they design unbelievably fast wheels. You wouldn't even see an external nipple on any of their wheels because it's just not fast. Um like they're built superbly well. Um, they're really, really solid, um, like top end wheels. I feel that's going to make a big impact on the way those frames will ride. Um, and they're like, they're not the lightest wheels ever. They're reasonably competitive, but like, yeah, I mean, in terms of like speed, like the, the speed that those guys are going to be riding that bike, like, you know, throw it, throw all the weight to the, you know, throw it in the wind because like, yeah, you, you want the arrow at what they what those guys are doing. It looks like they've spent some because I remember when we were first talking about decathlon coming in, it was like, well, what are they gonna do for time trial bikes? And they've looks like they've legitimately designed a time yeah, trial bike. It looks like a good bike. And they're running those like the data extensions, yeah. which are quite nice. Um they're like I would say they're on par with like the extensions that maybe the less highly paid riders that Yumbo are riding, the vision bars i mean even roglic he was running the vision bars and he won the olympics so like surely they're fast yeah. um but yeah i would say they're like comparable um i honestly like even the helmets that they've designed like the that's to me the most surprising um piece of the puzzle is like 
even bringing out helmets, which also look quite good. Like they, they've basically made a Proton, they've made a Utopia in the cask world, and then they've made like a slightly longer, like, you know, Mistral type type helmet. So they've like, they've really like crossed their T's and dotted their I's. So yeah, I mean, like, I don't think it's a huge thing to get like up in arms about or being like, oh, you know, finally, like bikes are going to be super affordable. They're still like, you, you don't get a free lunch. These bikes are still expensive. They're still, you know, top end, you know, race winning machines. Um, but yeah, it, they don't also look like, you know, pieces of crap. They look, they look quite good. But the fact that they have managed to create a, at least a look of research and development, Okay, like let's say it's all fake, that, that, that this was all done for the team and all that kind of stuff. It looks legit. Like it does look like a package that's been put together that has involved some form of research and development from a major brand that's not necessarily a cycling brand. That's kind of a good thing ultimately. Like, yeah, absolutely. And at least like even if it appears that the frame is like, you know, it looks good and like it looks fast. You got fast guys on it. Like, I do they have any fast guys on it? Who's actually <laughs> is, so ben, just, this ben, is, is yeah. ben O'Connor still on the ben team? Ben O'Connor. Who else are they? He's, he's got? a quick. He's a quick guy. Yeah. Um. He's he's pretty good. It's a shame to see the BMC leave the peloton when it when it just entered its like the peak of its arc. I believe. I think that's one of the coolest. That team machine R. It looks insane. Sick. It's insane. It's yep. also insanely expensive. It's yep. about the most expensive complete bike you can buy. I think Aussie retailing. It's about twenty seven thousand um, from <laughs> from an authorized like retailer. And there's no stock, of course, so you can't even get them. Um, I think the frame set is about thirteen thousand. The last time I checked with the bars. Um, but oh man, it looks good. It looks like a, that to me is one of the best looking bikes. So it's a twenty-seven, ever- yeah. But isn't that interesting? It's a twenty-seven thousand dollar bike that Peloton, won't be yeah. in the pro won't be Peloton. in the Peloton. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. ridiculous. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know how they're going to sell that now, but um, I mean, at least in Australia, the BMC market hasn't been super big. Um, we've been a BMC retailer for a while and there's nothing wrong with BMCs. I really like them. I've had them in the past and yeah, they just don't seem to have that brand power that, you know, a Cannondale or a Pinarello or like even Giant to some extent now, you know, the, like a brand like BMC, I feel they've kind of missed the mark in the, uh, I've always seen them similar. Somehow they've always sat similar to a focus for me, which is not necessarily warranted in terms of, I don't know, that I've actually... I've only ridden a BMC time trial bike, but um, not necessarily the same in terms of heritage and the rest of it. But that's kind of almost just the the number that I see on the road. It's yeah. kind of Focus and BMC are sort of the similar thing. If you're in the industry or at least you're really bike nerdy, BMC, their quality is like almost unmatched. They're incredibly well made. Um, even they like a few years ago, I think in like 2019, they released this um, t- like Team Machine 01 Masterpiece where they've done a super limited run of bikes with like incredibly well done like carbon layup and there's actually no like paint on them. It's just you see the exposed carbon and it looks the same inside as it does outside and it comes in this big metal box. Like brands don't just do that. Like not many brands do that. Like Specialized don't do that. Like none of the big brands do that. Like BMC, they really care about what they make and they they put a lot of time and development into it and – Funnily enough, like they actually collaborated with, um, I think it was Sauber, the F1 team, um, to use their uh, wind tunnel um, to design their TT bikes. And their most recent one, they used that F1 wind tunnel um, to design the new um, triathlon bike that they've made, um, as well as like the older TT bikes that Rowan Dennis took to World's Victory and and the World's Time Trial. Um, But yeah, like... Big shame to see such a you know well researched bike brand leave the uh, leave the space. It's got to be one of the like if you had a, a a graph of brands where it was like marketing versus actual product. research and product <laughs> yeah. development. Like BMC is right down one end of yeah. the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, because it, it. I mean, maybe it maybe it does have a really big following in in Europe compared to what we see here. I don't really think it's got much. It, the the brief chats I had with Grant about it doesn't have a huge 
foothold in the US. Like it's got a cult following, but it's kind of similar enough to here. But given the amount of money they spend on it, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I, fu- I think they found their their niche in the triathlon space. They make like you oh, know, market leading triathlon bikes, like just unreal. Um, like their t- their TT bikes are also like second to none, but like their market for time trials is pretty minimal. Like globally, I feel um, if you you know if you're getting a time trial bike, like you are one in a thousand yeah. or, or so. All right, guys, let us know your thoughts. Decathlon in the World Tour, big deal or nothing? Fake news. Fake news. All right, you've ridden a few bikes, Edwin. Finally, I've got someone in here to talk to who's ridden a lot of bikes and we're not just like throwing random ideas out there. So if I had to say, yeah, well, let's let's maybe talk about over the last couple of years, the top five bikes that you've ridden and let's let's go into why. So for context, I build like I'm, I'm a mechanic, so I build a lot of nice bikes and just like by virtue of my job, I've built – Pretty much like almost every bike in the past like three, four years that there is to, to you know, to build, um, at least like major yep. market leading ones. Um, I've ridden quite a few, like I've owned a few bikes over the years, so I, I know what they feel like as well. But um, I feel like I, I get a fairly good picture of a bike just by like testing it um, through my job. So um I would definitely like have five bikes in different categories. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's like, there's a, a few different bikes that are available now that I would buy for racing. And then there's a couple of bikes that I would buy for just riding or just having like a beautiful thing. Um, and for me, like, yeah, there's, there's only a couple of bikes that are actually made now that I personally would buy. Um, just because like I, I really like the way that it rides and I really like the way that it performs or, you know, feels or, you know, any sort of like characteristic like that. Yeah. So I guess we'll start off with like the racing bikes. Um, I'm a little bit biased. I'm very nerdy when it comes to aero and um, how fast a bike is. Um, and I do a lot of crit racing. Um, and in Australia, you don't get too many hills in racing. So like an aero bike is definitely the way to go. So I'm always thinking aero in my mind um, when purchasing. Um, or at least, you know, if I'm if I'm going to race a bike, I, I want a bike to be aero. So the top three that I would ride now, um, given that I could have any three bikes, would be the bike that I currently have right now, which is at the top, which is a Cannondale Lab 71, which is a real Lab 71. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not fake painted. It's a real one, um, which is a little bit contrary to the aero, my typical aero mindset of a bike, but um, we'll get on that in a second. Um, number two, I would go a Scott Foil, the new one. Um, that's crazy i really love the way that that rides um and it's super light um yeah highly what does that build up as like so is that about seven and a half kilos it's about seven and a half seven four if you build it up really nice i haven't ever seen one seen the the sl so there's there's two levels of frame there's a normal height like they're both the hmx carbon but the sl has the sl seat post which is completely straight um it doesn't have that flex design or the rear light in it um and it also has no paint it's just got clear coat so yeah, okay. it's actually lighter than the world tour bikes um which i've seen a couple of those in person and they're like they've got a pretty thick glossy paint job yes um that D- dsm yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yep. it's quite it's quite glossy um it's you can see the layup through the fork and through the back like through the back of the frame but there's yeah it's pretty um there's definitely some some weight in the paint there. Unfortunately, DSM are running the um, Dura Ace wheels, mm. um, which bring the weight down, like, you know, bring the weight back up, um, which if you were to just be a freelancer, freelance, like, you know, um, privateer, crit racer, you could put, like, a set of, like, 454 NSWs or, you know, NV, like, you know, 5.6s on there and it would be – it would definitely be um, around that Better seven and a half way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that would be that would be one of my top picks. Um, the Cannondale System Six would probably be number three for me. It's I I am a little bit biased considering I do own that bike, 
but it is one of the only bikes that's so laser focused on being one thing. Mm. It only wants to be aero. It only wants to be super duper fast um, and and nothing else. It doesn't worry about weight. Um, and even the high mod variant, which is like the lightest one you can get, I only got that just uh, like just at eight kilos um, with Jira Ace, um, Envy um, 5.6s, um, SES wheels, like, yeah, the whole the whole thing, and I could only get it to eight kilos. Did you ever find that – when do you find, I think, that weight becomes an issue with acceleration? I honestly think in terms of acceleration, weight at any speed you notice. So going from a standing start to like 20 k's an hour, you're – you you feel you feel a heavy frame and you feel a heavy frame at 30 k's an hour to 40 k's an hour and beyond um you it kind of feels like you have to spin it up like there's mm. a little bit of like spooling up time it doesn't just instantly react to what you're doing um but the trade off is that it holds speed like nothing else like the way that it just will you get it going and you get a aero bike like a system 6 or like a s5 you get it going and it's just like on a mission like it's 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 going and you there's no slowing down um that's kind of like a trade-off that's worth making especially if you're racing because you're not usually accelerating that frequently like to follow attacks and moves you're not making huge jumps in acceleration um you're like you know you'd be going maybe five k's an hour like faster here and there um but not like you know going from like a standing start at a set of lights to then like, you know, full gas again. Like you're not really ever doing that in racing. Yeah. Um, but that being said, like having a reactive frame does feel like you are saving energy just in, you know, it feels like you're doing less pedal strokes. So say if like there was a move in a crit race that went up the road on a heavy aero bike, you might be doing five pedal strokes to get to that move, but on a light sort of less aero bike, you might be doing three pedal strokes to get to that move. And that, you know, when you when you ride it, you might perceive that as like saving more energy, but in reality, you're probably saving a lot more just by having an aero frame that's saving you more overall in the long run. Um, like the peaks might be the it might be a bit spikier in terms of like your power, but the overall might be flatter because you're you're doing less. We talk about I've talked about this a bit with you in the past. Like, does this I don't know this kind of factor. We, we've phrased as like snappiness, right? And it's, it's, it's just that. It's that thing of oh, I need to close that gap or I need to get across to that. And for me, it doesn't seem to necessarily be related exactly to the weight of a frame. Like I've ridden lighter frames that I felt don't have that and I've ridden sort of heavier aero frames that – I would have thought have less acceleration, but seem to seem to actually have that kind of snappiness. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Like yeah, if you- a- absolutely. Like that's a, it's a really like, um, t- like it's a very tactile kind of thing with a bike. So it's hard to describe, but when you ride a bike, you, you it feels either really alive and ready to do um, anything that you sort of like give it, like ready to, you know, yep. react to your inputs um, and then maybe like a slightly heavier frame might feel a bit dead and might feel like it doesn't really want to do what you're trying to make it do. Um, and that is a kind of a reason as to why I like the Lab 71 so much is because it's unbelievably reactive. Like it is just, it's it's so fast um, to to respond to my inputs. Like I'll accelerate at any speed and it will just straight away be there. And it has that, that snappiness that you're talking about. Um, and it has a lot to do with like the way that a bike is like laid up and made and where the carbon fiber is in a bike. Um, so you want a stiff bottom bracket, you want stiff chain stays, um, you want stiff seat stays. So the whole rear end of the bike is just super ready for mm. any sort of stress. Yep. It just like it'll react to to a lot of um a lot of stress, which is obviously your your riding. Um like you can sort of go over that threshold where you overbuild those areas of the bike and there's so much mass in that area of the bike that you have to put more energy into it to sort of get um, your energy through that 
part of the bike and onto the road. So like as you're pedaling, your energy is going through the chain, through the drivetrain, through the frame, and then into the road. And like the more material it has to sort of like pass through to get into the road, the sort of slower it is. So there's there are bikes that strike a really good balance in being like aero and snappy and like um, bikes that are sort of light and snappy. They They all have like that that really well made like well designed frame i think it's got more to do with like the the r and d of a frame than it does the just the sheer like weight on a paper like so you're but you're talking about essentially are you saying all premium bikes have that not quite there there are bikes out there that don't um i used to ride an s5 um for a long time and that that feels like you have to bring it up to speed um, for sure. And that's one of the most premium bikes there is. Like Slash it's, popular bikes. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's a very radical bike. So, I mean, you know, it's, it sells itself just on its looks, but yeah, it's also like incredibly high performing. Like it's a fantastic bike, um, but it does take a little bit to bring up to speed. And there's, there's a few bikes on the market that are like that. Um, the bikes that are sort of like in my list to ride sort of have a bit less of that. What about going the other way? So I I gather like when you're saying the S5 and that sort of thing, you're saying, oh, that they're a bit sluggish to react, blah, blah, blah. What about going the other way in the sense that there are two, is there a two noodly sort of type bike in that, staying in that sort of top end? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're for sure are bikes that are too noodly. And like I would say a good example would be like the Atheos mm. um, that Specialized came out with a few years ago. Um, you ride one of those and especially an S-Works Atheos, you ride that and it's just like it feels like it's just, you know, flapping around underneath you. Like it re- it responds like no other bike. Like it is crazy responsive. It's a disc, fra- it's a disc bike so it's got through axles so it's stiff. Um and it's super duper light, so you just take it up a hill, and it will just it'll it'll dance up there. But yeah, I just feel like as you're riding it along, it feels like it's just flopping around, yep. um, and it's not really like you know absorbing your energy the way that you want it to. Like you feel like you're kind of using all your power to like bend the bike around underneath you rather than like put it into the road. Um, so like there are definitely frames that go too far in that direction being like you know too light too reactive and then just they feel you know a little bit inefficient in that sense so to finish that up you were so it was cannondale lab 71 yeah and then scott foil scott foil uh, um high mod system high six. Mod system six okay. um and then um actually s-works venge mm-hmm. um that is another bike that's just laser focused on being one thing and I'm really sad that they discontinued it because it was a fantastic bike. The handling was just crazy. Um, it was just like on rails. You could build it up pretty light, um, and it just it just feels like it when you get it when you get on it. It just feels like a fast bike. It just feels like you know once you're going, you're going. Yeah. Um, but like yeah, it's a little bit dated now. But even still, like I feel like it's it's a fantastic uh, fantastic bike. Um, probably next would be a Dogma F. Um, it is almost to the point of being too stiff. Um, it oh, is, really? Yeah, it is. Okay. It is crazy. It's out of like, it's just, it, it's super duper rigid. Um, but it's, again, it's quite light. You can get it really light. We have a staff member who's, his bike is about like 6.8 kilos. Um, he runs like biker head wheels. So like, it's, you know, <laughs> you know who you are. It's a gray, it's yeah. a gray area if that's a legal race machine, but still it's like, Crazy light, crazy stiff, and super aero. So, mm. like, that kind of does it all. Um, you pay for it, but it definitely does it all. Um, like, it is it is stiff, though, so it's it's not a bike for everyone. Let's be honest. The majority of people that are actually riding that bike, that surprises me. It's – I feel like – Do they know it's, what they're riding? It's not – a bi- it's not part of the purchasing decision. We sell lots of Pinarellos. I've built plenty – um, that seems to be like a, a constant, like people are just always, they're like, it's a Pinarello. It's the best. Like what's the best bike on the market now? Personally, I'm not sure if it is the best bike. I think there are bikes that are competitive, but you know, I, th- I feel like Pinarello have maintained that sort of 
position in the market. They're like, we're, we're on the best team. We've got the best bike. It's like, yeah, it's priced as if, as if it is the best. Um, so yeah, no, they've done well and, and their product is good. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, it, it, they're not taking you for a ride. Kind of t- brings me to, um, I don't know if this is a, this is a question. No, it is a question. So you work in a bike shop. Is it easier to sell aero or lightweight? There's two sort of distinct like customer groups, I think. So there's like, I, I would just categorize them as like performance cyclists and then just leisure cyclists. Um, and then within those two categories, there's obviously like subcategories of, um, of riders, but typically the performance cyclist is a little bit more savvy about the way, like the technicalities of the bikes that they're buying. Um, and also they're usually a little bit more, um, uptight for money. So like okay. Jesse Coyle, very good example, yep, yep, yep. super uptight, doesn't even run bar tape. Mm-hmm. Like mate, mm-hmm. it's, it's like mm-hmm. 10 bucks. What are you doing? Um, he does now. So I can't, I can't actually like, um, <laughs> I can't, I can't talk shit on that anymore. Um, but you got that end of the spectrum, and then so they've, got, they've, kind of, they've kind of researched. They know what's going on, right? Okay. They know what's happening. They well, know what's fast. They know sort of like the stats behind. They know like what's per dollar is probably their buying decision. Like you know, they're always thinking like you know what's per dollar. Whereas like a leisure cyclist is thinking in more of like a you know. Watts is not really a good way to – Watts per dollar is definitely not what they're thinking. They're just thinking like what is the nicest, like what is the the comfiest, what is like the best looking, um, like aesthetically, you know, what what's the most – like. So, they've, so they, have, they have like an image – they have an image in their head of what their Instagram post looks like of the bike. And they will sort of build this yeah. entity up from there. How how the performance of that bike is at forty five kilometers an hour is not necessarily that big a deal. It's yeah, it's definitely not part of there. Like often the the riders who can afford such nice bikes, they are working a job which doesn't permit them to ride a yeah. bike to actually reach that speed because like to 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 be a fast bike rider you have to put in a lot of work and it requires a lot of training and um you know if you want to be super quick like you just have to ride a lot and like these guys who are buying really really nice bikes like there's nothing wrong with the riding that they're doing they really in, they enjoy it the same as any other person who rides you know a lot um but they just can't you know, they might not be able to take it to that speed. So it's not really in their mind about, you know, that, that, that like the, the speed in which the, the bike goes is not really like too important to them. So they that, care that more leisure about how it looks. So that's the leisure cyclist. Yeah. Yeah. So are you in, is the inference then that that is the more lightweight? So when I, when I initially said what's easier to sell lightweight or aero. Yeah. They, so a leisure cyclist will look at weight. Cause I feel like a, a leisure cyclist is, is a little bit like behind on the tech and like the buying decisions of a lot of, um, you know, uh, the buying decisions of the, the, the market now, like a lot of riders will be like research their product. They know what they want. They know exactly what, you know, it tests in this test by this person and, and that, but like a leisure cyclist, they probably don't have the time to look at these, this research and they might just see like, you know, weight on a pa- like on a page and they'll just be like, that's lighter. So therefore it's better. Um, so that's kind of like the leisure cyclist, I guess. They'll just look at like um, a spec sheet and if the weight is less, therefore it's better. Right. Um, because okay. they might not have the, the facility to like really research a bike and like, Think it's about. an easy, it's like a, that's, that's the indicator, right? Yeah. There you see yeah. that weighs less. Yeah. And okay. then therefore it's like, and therefore it's better. Not saying all leisure cyclists are like, no, we're, we're clearly, we yeah, are there's a, 100% yeah, stereotyping. Yeah, here. We are like, hundred percent stereotyping here, but that's uh, there's definitely like, you know, and also like for them, comfort is a, is a factor a lot of the time. So they might think, oh, like these racing wheels, like, you know, I might not take those cause they're, 
you can't run as big tires on them or like this frame is like, you know, they might think rather than a dogma, they might get an MV melee because you can fit bigger tires in it or, you know, some, something to that effect. So like the comfort's a, a factor in, in their minds as well. Yeah. And also integrated cockpits scare that kind of um, customer off as well because it's not as adjustable, you know, you can't roll the bars up, um, you know, it's less comfortable to ride. So, yeah. And is the performance rider then, are they coming in and they have a budget and it's like, I want to go as fast as I can for as mid, as little money as possible. Okay. That's almost always the case. Like okay. it's very rare that you find someone who comes in and they want to go as fast as possible for the most money as possible. They're like, no matter the expense. Yeah. Because the, per- the people that are really trying to push the bike to push their bikes to their limits are like the younger guys and they would be maybe not working or working not as much and then not having sort of the facility to get really nice components. So they got to work within a budget and they might be like, all right, I can, I can get a, you know, a 50 mil deep wheel set from zip and it's going to cost me 3000 bucks. Um, or I could get it from Winspace or mm. Hunt and it's going to cost me, you know, 2100 bucks. Um, so I might just go for the cheaper option. And it's like in their minds, it's like the same same thing, um, but, you know, less money. So like they're getting equal performance for less money essentially. So many ways I can take this conversation because I'm just like I'm just thinking in my head, it's like then what is the the kind of hierarchy of – of componentry or is everything just a package anyway? So it doesn't sort of matter. So by that, I mean like, uh, 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 is, is it first step? Okay. Aero frame. Um, okay. Then, then I, then I'm going to work on the, the deep dish aero wheels. Like I'm just trying to, I'm trying to piece together in my head how the, how the purchase unfolds. We'll, we'll just go like keeping with the stereotypes. We'll just go for a stereotypical, like what's per dollar build. Yep. It'll just be it, the the starting um like the the starter pack would be SRAM Force yep. um Ultegra DI2. Yep. So like no Jira Ace, no SRAM Red. Yep. People are probably thinking Great I might for I might crash it. Mm-hmm. Um it's pretty much the same thing as the brand, like the top end product anyway. Um then they would go for maybe like a set of Windspace wheels or even here in Australia a set of Caden wheels. Um, super affordable, like top end performance. You're not really like losing a whole lot there. Um, and then they would go for maybe like, you know, a step down frame. So like a, they wouldn't get a lab 71, they might get a high mod or they might even just get a normal, um, you know, Cannondale super six Evo. Um, they might get something like a giant propel, you know? Yep. Does the rider's experience come into this? So a, in in terms of like a customer comes in and i want i want to go as fast as i can like is there is there a discussion about um what bike you had previously um and therefore does that potentially influence the direction of of where it goes i feel like people they're very like if they've started on a sort of lighter weight, more all roundy type bike. They'll stick with that throughout okay. their riding career. Um, not a lot of people have both or try, you know, one thing or the other. Like uh, some riders, they they just want the fastest bike and they'll be like, all right, it's an aero bike. I'm just going to have that. And it's always going to be an aero bike because it's always faster. Um, so like, you know, some some riders are, are, you know, are like that. They'll just be like, it has to be this because it's just that on paper, it's the fastest. Like that's what I've got to have. Um, but some riders, they'll come in and they'll be like, I've always ridden climbing bikes. I, I want a bike to sort of be within this kind of weight category. Um, and I want to be able to ride it all day. Um, a lot of the time, like people, they complain about aero bikes being super uncomfortable, mm. which is true. Mm-hmm. Um, I've ridden them for years and yeah, like longer rides on them do suck. Like they're, <laughs> they're pretty, they're yep. pretty hard on your body. They beat you up, but, um, you know, if you're doing the training, that's going to be. But they're not, and then yeah. this is sorry. So this is like <laughs> this is the the thing that no one. Well, I know Jesse would like be so pissed off. I don't challenge you on this because it it is it's like one of the gripes that we do see. Like especially like you're out at Bobbin Head or something, and someone's going up Bobbin Head in like 12 minutes, maybe 15 minutes yeah. on a System Six, and you're just there going, why? 
How does this person end up on that bike? Well, I feel like people, they just want to ride a cool bike. Yes. And like, it is, like, I feel like aero bikes have this very, like, this aura of it being cool, this air of it being a cool bike to ride. Um, cause they look sick, mm-hmm. like, you know, fast people tend to ride them. So, you know, you might feel fast by association, um, regardless if you're fast or not. Um, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and you know, I feel like that's kind of just how people end up in that situation. Um, very rarely are you going to see someone who's like, you know, actually like pushing the pace, like, you know, on a system six, up bobbin head like that's a that's a rare kind of rider and the person who's doing that they would do it no matter what bike they're riding True. like even if they were riding a tri-band from decathlon they're still going to be going as hard as possible up bobbin head like for that kind of rider the bike is a tool um but like you know for the typical sort of more normal kind of rider who would be riding up bobbin head you know not as quickly they they would they're riding like a cool thing that they have it's not so much a tool anymore it's more of like a this is a really nice thing that I-, I totally get that and but my only sort of pushback on that is that ultimately the the cool factor for them maybe it wears off and they're left with a really stiff fucking yeah, uncomfortable yeah, yeah. bike that if they'd ridden a giant defy i don't know but then you'd sort of say well Maybe that wouldn't get them as aroused in the morning to get out on the bike because oh, it's a giant defy. It doesn't yeah. look as cool as that big aero thing over there. Absolutely. So, like that's a, I get customers like that all the time. They're like, I've got this aero bike and it looks sick, but I, I can't ride it because it's too – like I only ride it for like two hours because it's like it's too stiff and, and it's so too uncomfortable. People will say that to you. People say that to yeah, me like right. – all like the time. proudly as in like, oh, can't I, can't, or it's just, oh. Well, they're just like, I want something else that's equally as cool, but I can actually ride it. And I feel like that's where the market's going because like, you know, Cannondale Specialized, they made these bikes that are like so laser focused on one thing, um, being like aero and fast, and they just end up being uncomfortable just by a design because that's just how you make a fast bike. It's just, you have to have deep seat tubes, um, like deep seat posts that are just uncomfortable. So riders just, they're not as keen to ride them. Um, and then, you know, these brands, they've gone and made like specialized, they made the SL7 and now they got the SL8. And it's like, you know, they're trying to claim that it's as fast, but like having ridden them, it's probably not not as fast. Um, and then like Cannondale, they've gone and made like, you know, Super 6 Evo 4 and it's like, okay, well, this is like the replacement to the, Super Six Evo and the 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 um the Super Six the System Six so yeah and then you've got brands like Cervelo who have got two different products for two different needs which is kind of the way that I I would prefer brands to do it I'd like to have brands who have products that are more focused on one thing and being good at one thing and then you can have you can choose we started this kind of whole thing out and we were both talking about we we both froth aero bikes right. And there's 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 a reality here where the aero bike dies out. Like what Cervelo is doing is probably I mentioned this in the past, but it's it's probably not as financially viable as like just pump out the one mold. So just do the SL8 and tell tell everyone that it's as fast as the previous model and or it's faster than the previous model. So things are good. So the you know to be selfish for a moment, like we're probably the or a tiny part of the market. Oh, we're the minority. We, for sure. we are we are gonna lose yeah, this hits. Every every day of the week for sure. Um like yeah, it's it's just not that many people who are keen to ride such a you know specific and to like, actually machine and but like, to also get like get the benefit of it. And I was mm. thinking about this because I was I'm back on the canyon a bit at the moment and I'm like, I really, really like this bike. Like it's it's fucking fast. Yeah. Like it, it yeah. is. But yeah. It's it's really not for everybody. It's not. It's it's a specific like it's a ra- it's a racing bike. Like mm. it's designed for racing, and like if you're training on it, it's nice to train super fast as well. Yes. Like that's um, like I I don't really like subscribe to the whole like you know put training wheels on and then like you go faster on race day. Like you may as well just train at the speeds that you race at. Like what? <laughs> What's the a point of pup. what's what's young the point? Of, <laughs> what's the point of training any slower? It doesn't really make sense, but. Um, it's like, that's, did you you ever, did you ever training, training wheel? 
Uh, I've had. When was training, your last training, like proper training oh, wheel? Like twenty, probably like my actual racing wheels or my training wheels, <laughs> which were, happened to be alloy back in like twenty eighteen, I think, when yeah. I had a rim brake Merida Reacto. I didn't even have carbon rims, so I just ran the alloys that I had. So those would have been my. That was the last time, and then from since then, I've had carbon wheels ever since. But like the the air, like the event of the disc brake, what's the point in having a set of training wheels? Like you're not gonna wear the rim out you're just going to wear the rotors out the same as you would on an alloy set and the cassette's going to wear out the same like the only thing that you're sort of you know using more than you might like to is your tires yeah but like you know if you like to if you race with any frequency or you like to ride and you like your every minute spent on your bike to be the best like you're just going to ride the best tires anyway the the other thing is like and uh, because i think more about it like oh maybe i should maybe get some training wheels on the bike chris you know to do that but like the more I think about it, to, to get to the parts of the ride that I enjoy is sh- shit. Like I hate the 45 minutes mm-hmm. to get to a Kuna or, or the hour it takes to bob and head. So yeah. why would I want that to take longer yeah. than it has to? It's like get me up there, then I'll do an extra rep or yeah, something if that's exactly. sort of, yeah. Well, I always like when I used to ride a lot, I would think about this and I'd think like why would I want – this experience that I'm having right now to be any less good than it is like than it could possibly be like I'm riding the best possible bike and like the experience that I'm having the only thing that's letting me down is me or like potentially the weather but like you know I'm I've got no excuse for this experience to be bad so it's like you go on a training ride and like if you ride with any sort of frequency like why would you want that time that you're spending riding because you spend so much time riding why would you want that time to be any less than the best Mm. um going out and doing you know 30 hours a week or whatever you want every one of those 30 hours to be the best it can be because that's what you're doing like you want that to be the best the best quality so i don't training wheels they're over they're done all right it'd be remiss of me to get a mechanic in and not um have a bit of a chat about mechanical stuff so general tips where, where are we? What do we got? First things first, keep your bike clean. That is absolutely the, uh, that's the key to avoiding a trip to the bike shop and avoiding having your bike lo- um, locked in bike shop limbo for any period of time. Weekly clean? Is that sort of? Weekly clean, as frequent as you can manage. Um, like being a bike mechanic myself, I clean my bike once a week. Usually I do it Friday mornings. Um keep it clean. And I've only, I've never had to service my bike. I only sort of do jobs like here and there as they sort of pop up. I mean, I'm not a good example because I know what to look for, but um, yeah, if you just keep your bike clean and you keep on top of like keeping your drivetrain clean, keeping your brakes clean, everything clean, like all the moving parts, as long as it's just clean, you'll be amazed at how long you can go without a service. Um yeah, things start to go bad when there's lots of dirt, lots of grime. Like that's that's what really lets things down and like it accelerates wear. So like the dirtier it is, the more quickly it's going to need a service. Um, like things will start going wrong. So that's absolute number one tip. Um, number two tip is get a torque wrench um, and learn how to – just make tiny adjustments on your bike that might, you know, save you a trip to the bike shop. So say like, you know, you might want to change the height of your shifters. You might want to change your seat post height, but you're not worried about like cracking the bike or like, you know, cracking handlebars or something. Say like, you know, you might have gotten a little bingle and your like steerer and the front wheel have gone like a miss. Grab a torque wrench and just learn how to tighten those bolts up yourself because it'll you'll be amazed at like the amount of jobs that you can do with just that um tip number three is learn how to get rid of the squeak in your disc brakes because ah. that is i get a lot of customers with that and that's uh it's a relatively simple fix um there's a few different ways to fix it but if you can learn how to do it at home um all you need is like some disc brake cleaner, um, like a blowtorch and um, just like some toothbrushes, like some old manky toothbrushes you're not using anymore. So we're talking about the squeal? We're talking about squeal, yeah. disc brake squeal. Yeah. So usually that's the pads have been contaminated. Yep. They just pop them out, 
pop your wheels out, pop the pads out, and then you just hit them with a blowtorch for 30 seconds up to a minute. Um, and what you're looking for is you're looking for the pads to smoke, which is oil burning off. So when oil burns off, it turns to smoke and it's white. So you wait until the smoke stops and that's when you've burnt all the oil out. Um, put the pads back in, hit your rotor with some disc brake cleaner, and then your pads should go completely back to like as they were brand new, essentially. So that's an easy one. Like, you know, you don't even need to like, you know, do any like do anything really that insane. You don't need to like change the pad alignment. You don't need to touch your calipers. All you're doing is just taking out your pads, burning them until the oil comes out, and then putting them back in. Because that one happens super frequently with disc brakes, um, especially if you ride in like bad conditions. How much sealant in a 28 mil road tire? That's going to take number two as the as right. the as the uh, the number two spot from cleaning your bike, and then it's learn how to set up tubeless yeah. yourself. Um, it would put me out of a job if everyone knew how to set up tubeless. <laughs> And then you would never come to the yeah. shop. So I wouldn't have any chat about it. I would, yeah. um, I would be unemployed. No, my last w- oh, anyway, <laughs> my last wheel is a success. I can see some sealant on the rims, yeah. but you know, we'll, yeah, whatever. We'll, we'll look past that. Yeah. Um, that is, it's initially it's quite hard, but the more you do it, the easier it will get. Like as with anything in life, um, the, the more frequent you do it, the better you get at it. Um, tubeless is not that hard to set up. It's got a lot of like – you get a lot of horror stories of people being like, oh, I've tried this many tire levers and this many pumps and no matter what, I can't do it and it's always messy and I'm getting sealing everywhere. If you take your time with it and you just have like a very sort of like – if you have a method um, to, to do it, that's like – it's it's foolproof. Where do you stand on the ghetto home method? I Are used you, to do that. That's to, how yeah. I learned. That's okay. how I learned to do tubeless sealant. Um is like before I was an actual full-time bike mechanic, I would just take my bike apart and like as I was racing and riding and training all the time, like my bike would just fall apart on its own um, as with any bike with use. So I had to learn how to put it all back together and like fix it all up. So that's sort of where I learned and I just, I was like, it's a tire, like how hard can it be? Just if you get yourself a couple tire levers and you've just got a little bit of patience, um, and some sealant, you will you will be able to do it. It's just like I, I know this sounds lame, but it does get it gets better year on year. It's it's I yeah. do feel like the the tires, the rims, even the sealant has got like it's all starting to finally yeah. Come it's together. it's all like it's getting to the point where anyone can do it. I feel like it's still got a lot of stigma. Like people are like, oh no, I can't do tubeless, can't service it myself. I'm just gonna stick with tubes. Um, for sure you can do it yourself. It's like it's it, you'll get your hands dirty and it will be messy. It's going to be ugly to start, but you will you will get there and it will be in the long run being able to do it yourself is such a massive time save. The only time tubeless has ever well it hasn't let me down, but it's like it's I've properly gone ah is the day before a big event flat. Like yeah, tubeless fail. So, yeah. like, even just before I did Grafton this year, went out for the the ride to the dam, mm. got the the flat on that ride, and you're like, the day before, you're like, do I plug it now? Is it is it, is this? Do I want to do the race on a plugged bike? Like, yeah, and yeah. Then, then, but I was just went, no, no, stuff it. I'm going to completely replace the 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 tire. Yeah, if you got the skills, like. I haven't had an experience like in Tasmania recently for a tour of Tasmania. We had to, myself and one of the riders on the team had to go down to a bike shop. I basically said, hey, at this bike shop, let me use your workshop. I need to put this, uh, I need to put a new tire on this rim and I need to just borrow your compressor real quick because uh, like no one wants to race on a plug tire. And um, like, thankfully they, they let us use their equipment, which is very generous of them. If I had some jockey come into my <laughs> workshop and ask to do that. I'm not sure if I do the same, but they they was they were um kind enough to let us use their stuff. So yeah, being able to do that, it can really get you out of a like a bad situation. Because if you've got no tires, like what are you gonna do? You can't even ride. So what's the wattage yeah. loss on a plugged tire? This is what I need oh, to know. 
I need a bicycle hey, rolling like... resistance. Need that. I need that statistic. <laughs> yeah. Like how many plugs? <laughs> how many plugs? I'm... Yeah. How many like one one plug per spoke? What's that in wattage loss? Who knows? <laughs> All right, budding home mechanics, Edwin, um, of which I'm potentially not one. Um, what's what's the list? What what do we need to to kick this off? Um, you need a work stand. You need something to hold your work. Because if you are just doing it on the floor or putting your bike upside down, which is an illegal position, you can't have your bike upside down. Officially, officially illegal. It's no good. Um, you need a work stand. That's number one. Um, you need a quality set of Allen keys. Um, just like in the hardware store, like a good quality set. They'd cost you, you know, more than just the cheapest yeah, one. Yeah, a like decent you set. Can, yeah. yeah, a decent set of Allen keys. Like look after your bike. Um, a torque wrench. Fully, completely essential. Um, and then um, a chain tool for like, or and a cassette tool. Yeah. So for changing, you know, cassette rotors because they use the same tool um, and then changing your chain. Um, that I feel like that kind of home mechanics, that's most visits to the bike shop covered. Um, if you can change your chain, your cassette yourself and tune your gears, that's like, that's a... That's a lot of trips to the bike shop done. Um, you know, you say you're only really reserving it for like the things that are kind of a little bit more specialist, like bottom bracket removal, yep. um, like headset installation or servicing, um, things like that. Like I would, po- I'd probably just leave it to the, leave it to the guys in the bike shop because they know what they're doing. And like, yeah, fiddling with that stuff, you can if you try and you know MacGyver it you're probably not going to do. Is there anything specific around, because this is, I, I would argue my ability as a home mechanic has regressed. Like I do feel like five, ten years, maybe this was because I was obviously slightly more with the team that I was doing a little bit more hands-on, maybe not much, but like I'm just looking at that rim brake bike there and I'm going, yeah, could have could have sorted the brakes out. Yep. Index the gears. Yep. Well, not on that Wii group set, but um uh, yes, could have done that. Could have done the chain, change the brake pads, all that kind of stuff. I feel I've I've come backwards, and mostly because mostly because of disc brakes. Because now I don't know what the's going on with those, that bloody fluid in there. I don't I don't want to know what's going on in there. Is is that is that beyond the Chris Miller home mechanic? That's it's not actually. Um, it's like it's come to the point where it's designed like in such a way where doing it is so straightforward, but like you're a perfect example. Like you just, you're, you're scared by it. Yep. Like you're yep. worried. It's yep. like, you know, it's the boogeyman. It's like, wow, what am I, what am I going to do? Like, yep. how does this thing work? When in reality, like it's really, if you've either done it correctly or you've done it incorrectly and you will know if you've done it incorrectly. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you can really only like, <laughs> You can really only like fail or succeed. There's no like in between where you've done like a half ass job that is maybe like a bit gray. So um, I honestly think like bleeding disc brakes and like servicing disc brakes, it's way easier than you might think um, without getting too technical. Like you only really need like a syringe, the brake fluid of whatever your group set is um, and then like a little cup. And then honestly, you're, pretty much sweet for like the lifetime of your bike. As long as you don't need to re-cable things and like run cables inside frames, like as long as you just, you know, if your brakes get spongy, you can know how to sort of top them up with fluid and like get the air out, then you're sweet. You know, a lot of it is actually like overnight fix. I actually did like a pretty much like zero labor overnight fix for um, a rider in Tasmania. Um, their brakes were spongy after having been on the plane. And then yep. I did this like mountain, this like old school mountain biking trick where um, you just hold the lever in with like some fluid in a cup attached to the shifter yep. and the air just runs out overnight. The bubbles just escape. And then the next day your brakes are powerful and they're good again. So um, yeah. That's like really interesting. Even I, something yeah. like that. It's honestly the labor involved is taking out a screw and pulling the lever open. That's literally it. That's the labor. And then you just let time do the work to get the air out. So like, yeah, something like that is like it couldn't get any easier. Mm. 
I feel like it's just there's maybe like fluid involved. So people are like, oh, this is like scary. Like I don't know what I'm doing. Like, yeah. you know, if I put something in there that's wrong, like, you know, might might wreck it. But honestly, it's it, it shouldn't be scary. Because I will say like that the move to essentially maintaining your gears via an app mm. is a win for me. Yeah. Like I, I am more comfortable indexing my gears via an app than I was via a barrel adjuster. Yeah. Like absolutely. Like it's more it like it's almost gamified. Like you pull up a Shimano app and it's got all the gears um laid out for you, like how they are on the bike. And then it's got a little scale underneath and it shows you like how many notches you've got left of adjustment. And like it's just so it's like, you know, you just click the gears on your phone, they change in reality on the bike and then you can just like trim the derailleur to like, you know, left or right, make it a little bit you know, make the shifting better in one direction or the other. And then you're sweet. It's like, you know, it couldn't be any easier. Like we probably live in the easiest time for like bike ownership. Um, once the gears That's a are, controversial like, statement. That'll, well, that'll fire them up. <laughs> well, once the gears are set on, a, on an electric group set, like the only thing to take them out of tune is the chain is worn, like the drivetrain components are worn or the hang is bent. Those are the only two things that are going to change the the gears basically like, you know, falling out of tune. Like unless you've got some very sort of crazy setup that's running like, you know, non-branded like chain rings or you're mixing in mash, like maxing like bits and pieces from other group sets or like within certain lines, like you're running, you know, like a 105 chain and like a Jira Ace, you know, derailleur or whatever, like things might not mesh 100%, but like as long as everything is like as intended by the manufacturer, like you're going to be get like, it, it'll be so straightforward. Like we, we only ever really talk about the group set stuff when it goes wrong. And that's yeah. the nature of it. Like the power meter thing, whatever. Honestly though, like how many, how many people a week or a month would you have in and you, it's an electronic group set, a SRAM or a Shimano electronic group set of decent quality and you just go, oh, actually, no, it has just, it's dead. Yeah, almost never. Like, it's very rare. Like, sometimes you get electrical failures, like sometimes a battery might fail. But, like, very rarely, like, do you get a, a, a bike and it's, like, gone out of tune because the derailleur's, you know, gone walkabout. Like, yeah. it's it's almost never. Like, yeah, if you're taking care of your bike and you're just doing the normal maintenance, like, a cable's not ever going to snap on you. Like it won't stretch. Like the shifting's going to be super precise every single time. Um, yep. And if it's just not set up super precise every time, then it will be just a little bit, you know, um, mushy here and there. But um, yeah, like I feel that the the age of like bike maintenance that we live in is just the easiest to live with. But also in some respects, the hardest with things being internal and like, if you want to be a home mechanic, you kind of can't just like learn a little bit. You have to just learn everything because if you want to build a bike, you have to know how to do it's that all initial the hardest. Build. You know, yep. you, you need to know how to do all the hardest things, like fully internally route cables. You need to know how to like you know pair all these things up. Um, those are all like the hard bits of of bike mechanics. And the things that were simple have become like when you put those bars on that bike for me. It's like. It's a massive job. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're, you're doing a full. You're nearly doing a full strip and rebuild yeah. of the whole bike. Like, and I on the Devel was able to change bars and stems. Yeah, like that was yeah. not and a big deal. And it's straightforward. Um, yeah, I feel like that's kind of the that's the major difference in bikes now is that everything's proprietary, everything's internal. Like, you know, if you want to change anything, it's not really like you know, something you can do yourself. It's probably something you got to take to a bike shop. So unless you're willing to learn like all of those processes, then you're probably not really like going to be doing much more than like just changing your chain and cassette at home. So yeah, I feel like bike mechanics, you can't really go halfway anymore. You can't really be like competent enough to like change little bits of components here and there. You just have to know how to do it all or not really know how to do it at all. I'm I, I honestly reckon we'll, you'll be back next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jesse's done, mate. Jesse's done. He's done. He's done. Um, um, he hasn't actually answered my text. He doesn't even know you're on. Oh, wow. <laughs> right, really? He's properly. So he said, thanks, bro. To he, me um, <laughs> when I congratulated him, I sent him a text last night because it was the first night they were home. 
And or well, the only reply I got was a skull emoji. <laughs> so I, I've had the um, I've had some insight into what it's like now at the hospital from one of my colleagues. They say to bring energy gels <laughs> to the hospital <laughs> because you might need it. <laughs> like actually energy gels. So we might be selling Mortons to mothers. Well, that's that's that was the only thing he said going in. They, they weren't going to do <laughs> breast milk or formula. He was going to go straight to sugar straight water. Straight to Morton, yeah. Straight to sugar water. Jesse's just he's brought his electric stove. He's yep. got his sugar in the bag. He's mm. got the water. He's got the goo flask. Mm. He's ready, ready to, to make go. it up. Ready what is it like? Two cents a serving or something? He'll be going 80, 80 grams an hour. Yep, eighty grams an hour. Yep, yeah, right he's got it all planned out. All right, mate. Thank you very much for your time, Edwin. Thanks for we'll, having uh, me. We'll definitely either have you back on normal show or as a guest very, very soon. Um, and guys, thank you very much for watching as well. Uh, we'll be back next week. See you then. Appreciate it. Thank you.